Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens seemed to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. They were always looking for new fads and ideas and new revelations. So this thing Paul came up with, oh, this is kind of different. Let's find, let's, let's, let's take a hearing to it. It's interesting. So Paul standing before the council addressed them as follows. Now listen to how he account, listen how Paul handled this account. This is for all of us to understand, and this is how we could handle things. Whatever it is. Men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. See, he didn't bash them. He told them they were very religious. Mm -hmm. Well, they're very de dedicated to what they believed in. Mm -hmm. They were. Now, look what it says. For I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it. This is an opener for him. Look what he said. To an unknown God. They said, well, you know, just in case we missed one, we're going to put up an altar for an unknown God. Just in case we missed one of them. No, they did. They had an altar that had an unknown God. Now, this is Paul. This, he, he found an opportunity. And look what he said. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. Beautiful. I got right in. Got right in, perfect, right? Yeah. Now listen how he explains God. This is a beautiful description of how he explains God. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs. For he has no need. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. So God's in control of the boundaries. He's in control of the people that rise to power. He's the one control the ones who fall to power. It all has to go through God's hands. That's why we're to pray for our, human, our leaders. Right. Because God put them there. Or he allowed them to go there. And we're always to respect our boundaries and borders. Because God put the boundaries and borders in place too. If you go back in the Old Testament, people were trying to make one thing of everything. Remember Babel? Mm -hmm. yep. They were trying to all pull together. And God says, no, I'm going to scramble them. He changed all their languages and then he established borders. Same thing today. The borders that are instituted in our nation, in our world, were instituted by God, and we should always respect them and appreciate them. Amen? Amen. God put the borders in boundaries, just like his nation Israel. God placed it where he wanted to place it. And there was borders all around it. And he determined the boundaries. Look what it says in verse 27. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and listen to this one and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Just trying to man, you know when you when you try to find something in the dark, you close your eyes. And they find him. That's how that's how that, that's what it, that's the analogy. That's what he's trying to say. Feel the way because he was he, because God has given all of us a measure to find him. He meets us halfway when we seek him, right? Mm -hmm. Look what it says. Perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Because the human beings goes off of what? Feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Feel our way towards him, right? Mm -hmm. Now listen to what it says. Feel their way towards him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. Thank God. When you I read that, you know when you feel sometimes that God's so far away when things are going heavy in your life? He is not far from any one of us. As a matter of fact, he resides in each and every one of us. He has our backs. He's in control, believer. We have to understand Amen. that. And whenever we're going through, I know all of us are going through different things right now, aren't we? And some of us are question, where's God? How come God let that happen? Well, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We can't figure out why he does it. We're, so, we're so short-sighted looking at what the problem is instead of looking at the whole picture. He's using it for a reason. Everything that goes on in our life is designed for a purpose. 
Amen. To mold us and shape us into the image of his son. So whatever's going on in your life, I don't care what it is, it couldn't have happened unless God allowed it. Now it's up to us to find out what the purpose in it was. Instead of saying, you can get bitter, yeah, that, how's that going to work for you? Getting bitter never solves any problems. It drives us, what, farther away from God and puts us back in the flesh. But getting better, understanding, all right, God's in control. I might not be able to figure it out right now, but I know down the road when I look back, I want to see why that happened. Because yeah. hindsight is what, 2020. I look back in my life today, all the things that I went through back then, I know, i seen God's hand in my life all the way, or I wouldn't even be breathing right now. Amen. When I think about the things that went on and occurred in my life. Amen. God carried me through all of that, even though I didn't know Him. Amen. He knew me. Amen. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God, and I look back now. Now, here's, what, here's the thing. Now that I know He took me through all that, whatever I'm going through now, I bank on what he took me through already. Yeah, yeah. So whatever he's been going through now, he's going to take you through it. And there's a reason for it. Because all that stuff I had to go through, that's how I had to find them. If I didn't go through none of that, I would have never found them. <clears throat> all right? And if I'm not going through anything now, I will never reach for him. It keeps me reaching for him and searching for him. So I can, so I can grow and change. He's trying to make something out of me Amen. through everything. Amen. Is it easy? Absolutely not. And can I do it in my own power? Absolutely not. I quit and give up. And you see a lot of Christians walking away from the faith because they try to do it in the flesh and try to figure out God in the flesh. And you can't do it in the flesh. His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So nothing can happen unless God allows it, and He provides a way of escape so we can handle it. Either you believe that or you don't. And if you don't believe it, you're going to be miserable <coughs> through the circumstance. All right. All right. Let's keep going here. All right. Though he's not far from any one of us. Verse 28. For in him, listen to this one. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't, shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. Everybody tries to make an image of God. They make gold calves, big birds, sphinxes, and all kinds of things to try to figure out and make them powerful like some kind of a god. They worshipped all kinds of statues back in them days, and they yeah. still do. See, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. Now look at verse 30. God overlooked people's ignorance. <laughs> Thank you, God, Thank for you, overlooking Jesus. it. Thank, Thank you, you for overlooking our ignorance. Yes. Amen. Amen. About these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to what? Repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is. How did he prove it? By raising him from the dead. And that's who? Yes. Our Lord and Savior Jesus. And he proved it by raising him from the dead. Amen. That's what proved it. Now look what it says in verse 32. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. You see, he was very interesting the way he spoke about God. Mm -hmm. He didn't bash them. He didn't tell them they were wrong. He was just telling them about the God of the Bible. That's all he was doing. Mm -hmm. And they were intently listening, even though they weren't believers. Mm -hmm. He was just interesting. How should we be? Interesting. So, you know, it says in Psalms, you know, he lives on bread and every word that comes in the mouth of God. You know, you're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. Did Paul say any of that? Oh, no. no. He wasn't acting weird. He wasn't acting strange. He wasn't trying to hand people a Jesus coin or a dollar bill with Jesus' name on it to try to catch them. 
No, he talked to them like normal human beings. Because if you do anything other than that, people are going to think you're weird. Yeah. And they don't want nothing to do with Jesus. No, we talk normal to people. And we act intelligently with God. We walk intelligently with God. Not all mystical and, and weird. Because people get turned off by that. I know I do. Yeah. Even when believers do it today, I get turned off by it. Please, stop it. That's not real. No, that's not real. That's not the way, the way you're acting is not real. Be yourself. Be yourself. Because we don't want to scare anybody away. We want to bring people in, right? I know I got scared away one time. Somebody handed me a, a, I don't know, a coin or something was on it. And they said something, you know, flip this side or flip that side. This side's heaven, this side's hell. What are you going to believe in today? It's like, okay, just remind me not to go where you're at. <laughs> and I say, yeah, what church do you go to? Well, I go to this and I said, good, thank you. And I thank for telling me, showing me what not to do. That's not how we catch people. We catch people by a life lived like Jesus Christ lived it. Yeah. Not by, did, Jesus didn't pass out any stuff like that. I don't know where people get that stuff from. That's nothing to do with the Bible at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, look, some laugh and say, we want to hear more about it. Look at verse 33. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the council, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So wherever he was going, he was catching some, and he wasn't catching some. But it didn't matter. He knew wherever he sent the word out, it was going to do what it was supposed to do. He didn't cry. He didn't say, oh, how come everybody didn't come? Let's count. Let's get a head count. How many people got saved tonight? Let's do a call. Get up here. Who got saved tonight? They do that in churches. They try to they, they yeah. manipulate people to come up and get saved over and over and over and over again. Really? No, all you're going to do is get saved once. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Don't say, oh, you better stay saved today, but if you act bad tomorrow, you better come back up and get saved again. <laughs> when did you ever act good? We can't do it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not in the Bible. People make people do all weird stuff. We don't do that here. Do, you, do, you meet, do, you tell, do I ask anybody, oh, time to get saved now. Put your head down and believe in Jesus and tell everybody you're a sinner. And you might be saved. Now, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. You hear the word of God. You receive the word of God. You believe the word of God. And you're saved. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer in the Bible. How can you say you're a sin? You don't even know anything yet. All you have to do is take it at its face value and believe it. First, you have to catch the fish before you clean it. We don't even know we, we don't even know we're sinners before we get saved. So how are we going to say a sinner's prayer? It wouldn't be real. We don't even know what it is. No. What saves us is hearing the word of God and believing the word of God. Not any. I don't say it doesn't. There's nothing in here that tells me that I gotta say a prayer for somebody to get saved. Did you ever see it? Well, show me where it is. It's not in here. Chapter 18, Paul and Corinth. That's why we're real here. We're not gonna get any, we're not gonna get fake, we're not gonna practice anything that's not in the Bible. We're just not gonna do it. Because it's that's all human, that's all humans adding things to the Bible. That's adding things to salvation. <clears throat> look at verse, look at chapter 18. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy with Claudius. Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. Paul was a tent maker. How did I know? I just told me. <laughs> hey, hey, you know Paul was a tent maker? No. Hey, how do you know? Hey, who's a tent maker? Boy, oh, I had to be a Bible cop scholar to learn that, right? <laughs> no, the Bible comes and speaks to the simple people. That's what it says. The common folk accepted it gladly. 
Amen. All the all the philosophies and all the all the intellectual people rejected Christ. They didn't accept Christ. And still today, all the intellectual people got to try to figure it all out. And they yeah. can't just take it at its face value and just love Jesus like a little child. He says, unless you come to me like a child, you'll never see the kingdom. Right. What does that mean? Empty all your, your, your stinking thinking of the world and all you learned out there. And become like a child. Take me by the hand and believe in me. And I will raise you up. Amen. Because people think they're too smart for God. <laughs> oh, that couldn't have happened. How could he have been in the how could he have been in the belly of a fish for three days? How did God part the Red Sea? I don't know, but he did something supernatural. That's how you know it was God. Amen. God is supernatural. God is not natural. Nothing's too big for God, amen? amen. If he amen. said he did it, he did it. And if it's recorded, he did it. And he wanted us to hear it and know it. And I believe it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. I don't have to be convinced. I don't have to look. I just take it at its face value. The Bible is God's word. That's right. And what his word says is what stands in my life. And that's it. Amen. Amen. I ain't going to question it. I ain't going to doubt it. Because when I do doubt it, it makes me miserable. The devil loves doubt. Yeah. He did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of what? Power, love, and a psalm. I think I sent that out. Was that yeah, the one I sent yeah. out today? Yeah. 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 Praise Jesus, right? Amen. I got a lot of responses from that one, by the way. A lot of people needed to hear that today. Amen. All right. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. Wow. He spent all his time what? Preaching the word, the word, the word. He didn't spend all his time learning it, he spent all his time preaching it. He testified to the Jews because you know what? Once you're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's the teacher. I don't have to get taught by men the word of God. I don't have to go to Bible college and learn God's word. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. Amen. And he walks me through life and teaches me. Amen. Read the Old Testament, how we pick the prophets. Namus was a fig picker. He wasn't a theologian. He was a farm worker. David was a what? Sheep herder. Yeah. Matthew was a tax collector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Mary Madeline was a prostitute. Yeah. Right? Peter was a fisherman. Yeah. Those are the people he calls. People that know that they can't do this. Not the ones that think they can, because those are the ones that crucified Jesus. The Pharisees that thought they knew God so well through his scriptures, right? So you search the scriptures because you think that brings you eternal life. The scriptures point to me. Amen. Jesus told them. Now look what it says. All this time he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, but when they opposed him and insulted him, Paul, look what he did. He testified to the, to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, but when they opposed him, as they always did, and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. That was their last chance, Paul said. I'm all done with the Jews. You killed your Messiah. You don't want to hear about him anymore. God said, all right, enough with them. Now go to the Gentiles. That's us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, right? Yeah. What they rejected, we accepted. Glad. That's why Paul's the apostle for the Gentiles. He's our, he's our apostle. That's why we're in the Paulian epistles. All the other apostles were for the Jews. Paul's the apostle for the Gentiles. Yeah, we're going to meet him. Yep. Then he left, look, and he went to the home of Titus, Justice, a Gentile. Look, he was a Gentile who worshipped God and left, lived next door to the synagogue. Mm. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, here it is, mm -hmm. and told him, I like my Bible because it's a red letter Bible because whenever Jesus speaks, it's in red. So you know. 
One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Listen to what it says. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. He gave him a little bit of insight what he was going to be going up, up against. Do you see it? I love this. He spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you. I guess Paul was wavering right there. When the Lord comes, that means that we're starting to get weary. Yeah. The Lord will come and comfort us, just like he did for Moses. Yeah. Moses was getting really weary, and God yeah. spoke yeah. to him again. Yeah. Just at the right time, God will speak to you. Yeah. <coughs> Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Speak yeah. out. Don't be silent. I'm with you, and no one will attack and harm you, for many... People in this city belong to me, Jesus said. Yeah. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. But when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. See when things change power? Things change when hands change. You never know the day is going to come when we get someone into power that hates the Bible and is going to try to get rid of it. You never know when that day is going to come. Look at verse 13. Because you know what? When the Old Testament, when they rejected, when they kept rejecting God, he pulled his hand back, they got conquered. His word was silent for 400 years they didn't read his word. Nothing to do with it. 400 years. Imagine how apostate you can go without hearing God's word for 400 years. Imagine what the human condition was then. Just look what happens with you when you get out of the word for a little while, how your condition worsens. Just imagine not hearing it in generations, not hearing it when it turned out. When they finally opened the scrolls, they started tearing their clothes. Oh my God, we don't even know what we're doing crazy. They were like amazed. Look at verse 13. They accuse Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. Here it is. The law, the law, the law. No, you can't, you can't work on the Sabbath. You can't pick, you can't pick up that. Now you can't get healed on the Sabbath. You can't do anything on the Sabbath. That's what they turned it into. They turned it into a hard, stone cold law where you can't do anything. And even Paul, uh, Jesus told him, "Don't you, if one of your sheep falls in the hole." Don't you get them out on the Sabbath or do you let them die in there? No, they, they couldn't practice it either. They went and got the sheep out. He was telling them they're a bunch of hypocrites. Yep. They don't practice what they preach. The worship in ways that are contrary to our law. Look at verse 14. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, Listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it's merely a question of words and names and your Jewish law, take care of it yourself. Even though, even even want nothing to do with it. Look, the governor didn't want nothing to do with it. I refuse to judge such matters. And he threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd, this is what they did. They grabbed Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him right there in the courtroom. But Galileo paid no attention. So I still don't want nothing to do with it. That's how bad they were. They beat him. Paul visits Ephesus and returns to Antioch. <clears throat> Wherever he went, he wasn't getting blessed, was he? He was getting bombarded everywhere he went. But Jesus told him to go, that he was going to be with them. Now, you hear me. You hear me good. Jesus tells you to go. And he's always going to be with you. Yeah. If you get prompted to do something and speak for God, do it. Amen. Jesus is with you. This goes for every believer. Everybody. If God's prompting you to help, say something, say it. God's got your back. Don't be afraid to say it. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Chentria. Then he shaved his head according to the Jewish customs, mocking the end of a vow. Then he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. They stopped first at the port of Ephesus, where Paul left the others behind. 
while he was there, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews. Again, he went to the synagogue. He still went to try to help them. He still went to try to reason with them. See it? But they asked him to stay long. They asked him to stay longer, but he declined. As he left, however, he said, I will come back later, God willing. Then he set sail from Ephesus. The next stop was the port of Caesarea. From there he went up and visited the church at Jerusalem and went back to Antioch. Oh, we're already out of time. All right, we'll just read a little bit more. Paul's third missionary journey from Antioch. Paul visits the churches in Galatia and Pergia. He was a mission boy. He was on a mission, wasn't he? Ever since he found Jesus, boy, he never stopped. Neither do we. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Pergia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. See what he did? He visited them and strengthened them. Amen. That's what churches ought to do. Visit each other and strengthen each other. Amen. Not tear each other down saying, you're doing this and you're not doing that. Amen. No, because if everybody, if all the churches were just in God's word, there would be no problems. That's right. the, the church would be complete, like the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But they're not in the Bible. They're in the world. They're accepting all kinds of nonsense in the church today. And we're not going to accept it in this one, that's for sure. Amen. We're, going to hear the, we're going to hear the word of God. And this is what's going to change us and help us grow. Amen. Hmm. All right, we're going to stop there. Thank you, God. Thank, Thank you. God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Yes.